All right. Thanks for uh, thanks for uh, joining me here today, or watching watching the, the video of this uh, of this stream on on recording. Um, this is a, a pretty high level talk, so we're not going to be looking at at a ton of at a ton of code here. It's more of a, a, a higher level discussion of some of the trends that are happening in the world uh, of data analytics and uh, important uh, changes in the in the infrastructure that are affecting. Uh, all of our programming languages, all of our uh, computational engines, our data analytics systems, um, and how we can th begin to think about them and to, to work, work better together to enable uh, this improvement of our, our computing infrastructure uh, to, happen, uh, to happen more quickly. So uh, I was just introduced. Uh, most of you know me from, from my work on the Python Pandas project. I, I haven't been doing as much uh, Pandas development uh, for the last eight years or so. Um, so Pandas, uh, in, in fact, is a 13-year-old project as of this month. And I was very active with it the first five years of its life, um, uh, building, building the, first, uh, the first versions of the project, beginning to build a developer community around it, writing my book, Python, for, for data analysis. But I handed over the project to the uh, to the open source community and the other key contributors in the in the in the project. People like you may know, like Jeff Jeff Reback, uh, Joris Vandenbosch, uh, Tom Augsburger, uh, and others who have carried on development up through up through the present. So, uh, when you're using pandas and you, you're benefiting from its uh, stability, its functionality, its, its speed, um, you know, remember that there are many other people that are involved with making that that project as good as it is today and as reliable as it is. So, uh, be sure to you know to thank them and, uh, and and remember that you know it's it's been it's it's been going on for over a decade and uh, a lot of the work has been carried on by uh, the the other volunteers in in the project. So this talk is uh, is going to be specifically about different aspects of. Uh, what I call computing silos that have that have developed uh, in, in different parts of our infrastructure, and the three different kinds of computing silos that I want to focus on are they are data silos, so data itself, how data is stored, how data is accessed, how data flows around our systems, uh, and then we come to computing engines, so systems that access data, compute queries on it, perform uh, perform ETL, feature engineering. Uh, machine learning, AI, where 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 the rubber meets the road and the computing the computing happens, um, and then there is the the problem of programming languages and language interfaces. And of course, uh, computing engines and data have to be used through some programming language. And so the programming interfaces that we use are of course very important to us because they're they're the only way that we can get access to these systems. Uh, and one of the reasons that that Python has become such a popular popular language uh, for, for for data science for for data engineering is is because uh, the Python language itself is very pleasant to program in. You can uh, you can express yourself uh, very easily. Uh, not only is it is it a good language for building software, but as as a user and just doing your your day to day job, uh, it's it's a, a language that uh, you know as as Fernando Perez said uh, says. Uh, the you know the creator of IPython and Jupyter, Python is a language that that gets out of your way, and so that's one of the reasons why it's become so popular. But there are other programming languages as well. There's there's R, um, there's uh, there's JVM languages like Scala and Java. Um, there's Rust, and a lot of people are excited about uh, excited about Rust nowadays. And of course, there's uh, languages like C and C plus plus that have been around seemingly forever. So we have a lot of programming languages and it creates distinct uh, eco ecosystem problems uh, around them and how they're used within, particularly within enterprises where you can't, it's not that you don't only have one programming language. In reality, you have multiple programming languages. So some of the, the problems that we see um, in that are what I call data silo problems uh, one of the biggest issues is that many workloads are plagued by serialization overhead. And serialization is the computing work that is spent converting data between different formats. And so that might be loading data out of a CSV file or loading data out of a parquet file. Um, the data is loaded into, into memory, perhaps, or it might be converted into some other uh, serialization or data format uh, for use in another, in another system. 
but it's not uncommon to see workloads uh, spend 70, 80, 90% of their time simply converting data from one format, one format to, to another. Uh, another problem that we see is that depending on the tool that you're using, how the data is stored, where you're accessing it, that the performance of getting uh, and the performance and overhead associated with data access and delivering data to applications is, is completely all over the place. So some systems are really fast to access data. Some systems, some systems are really slow. Uh, you, you have many different implementations of uh, reader interfaces to files. So you might be able to read one CSV file in one application uh, pretty quickly, whereas in another application, it's much slower because you're using a different library to read the CSV, CSV file. So you know, ideally, we would like to have consistently good performance uh, accessing and delivering data uh, in all of the places where, where we need it. Another problem that we see a lot is this problem of data being held hostage by, by a system. And this is not, uh, it, it's, it's sort of an artifact of, of the um, traditional way that the data analytics systems were built, which was in a very vertically integrated fashion. So you buy a, an appliance, which is your database system, uh, the people in your company insert data into that system, and then the analysts who are working on the data send queries to the database, which then which serves as the oracle. Uh, and there, you know, of course, it's no surprise that uh, one of the first database companies was called Oracle. The database computes those queries and returns the answers. But if you have an application where you need to export large quantities of data from a vertically integrated system that is responsible for storage storage computing and, and query interface, it can be quite slow to get data out of, of those types, uh, types of systems. And so even though you can technically get the data out um, of many data warehouse systems, the performance of importing and exporting large quantities of data can, be, uh, can, can create a lot of pain for, um, for the users. Um, another issue we see is that of different systems operating on different data. And so in modern enterprises, we see a lot of um, uh, different systems for handling streaming and real-time data and, um, and sy so systems that capture and, and deal with real-time data and then, uh, and then a data warehouse system which operates, uh, which operates uh, on uh, da data that's been ETL'd into a particular schema that's optimi optimized for query processing. And so many organizations are operating and, and running their workloads on on stale data that where they're, you know, they might have an ETL lag of, of 12 or 20 or 24 hours or even more in some cases. Some of the problems that we see, we, we see with compute engines, you know, firstly is that performance is, is, is pretty inconsistent. So if you're a data scientist, uh, there are many different uh, data frame libraries that are available in Python now. There's different data frame libraries in, in R. Um, Though there isn't a great deal of overlap in, in the code between those systems. And so the performance can be, uh, can be all over the place. Uh, and you see a lot of internal competition within programming, uh, programming language communities, you know, trying to see who can, implement, who can implement the best algorithms to attract more users to use their, uh, to use their tool. Um, one symptom of, of the fragmentation in computing engines is that um, hardware frequently goes underutilized. So, for example, a lot of a lot of systems in Python were built uh, for were, were built in the old days where you had a single core machine or or maybe a dual core uh, machine, and so writing algorithms to be able to utilize modern modern CPUs with eight physical cores or sixteen physical cores uh, was was not part of of the design requirements, and so uh, so many of our pieces of software. Uh, are not fully leveraging the uh, the hardware capabilities that we have today. Of course, there are new kinds of hardware that have been created, uh, like like GPUs, and now there's many different uh, custom chips for for analytics and data science workloads, AI workloads um, that are in in development. And so, building software that is optimized for these new kinds of hardware, not only the current generation of CPUs and taking advantage. Um, of the specialized uh, hardware accelerations that are available in those chips, but also taking advantage of new kinds of hardware. Um, it, it's been pretty slow in practice uh, for, for those improvements in hardware to make their way into the hands 
uh, of data scientists and their everyday, you know, in their everyday work. So I, for example, right now I'm working on an M1, um, I'm giving this talk from an M1 MacBook Pro. So, so Apple just changed uh, architectures uh, in, in their CPUs from Intel to Intel to ARM. And so all of that software, which has been built, that's been optimized for Intel um, hardware optimizations uh, is, is not, can't be used on, on, a, on an ARM chip. And so an entirely different set of hardware optimizations utilizing SIMD instructions uh, for ARM uh, need to be developed in order to fully utilize uh, these, new, these new processors. Um, the, the use of a particular uh, computing engine can also uh, create like a sort of lock-in using that, uh, you know, using that, that engine, uh, especially where there is, there is a coupling to a programming language that you, that you must use. Um, like, you know, if you're using, if you're using Spark, you really should use Scala to get the best, uh, to get the best, the best out of Spark. So even though you can use Python, you do pay a penalty when you use Python on top of Spark. Um, a problem, another problem that we see uh, with, with programming languages is that a lot of the computational machinery, which is used in the implementation of the libraries that we have, data frame libraries, data science libraries, um, that there isn't as much code sharing between programming languages uh, as, as, we would like, as we would like to see. Um, and so many of these projects are their own little islands uh, of algorithms uh, and IO code and, you know, so essentially, if you look at Pandas, Pandas has its own CSV reader, it has its own implementation of uh, most of its critical analytics algorithms. And so at the time that we, that we built the project, that was the best way uh, to solve the problem uh, very quickly. But a lot of other open source projects have done the same thing. They've built their own full stack solutions to all of these, all of these problems. And there hasn't really been a basis of code sharing and collaboration. Um, across projects within languages and between programming languages. Um, another issue we see is that the language interface uh, to a computing engine, what I was saying before, uh, one programming language run, running on top of a certain computing engine can perform differently uh, from, from another. And so to use, to use Spark as, as, a, as an example, uh, the performance uh, of using Spark for certain, for certain workloads can be variable uh, depending on whether you're using Python R or Scala. Um, and so ideally what we'd like to see is consistent performance across, uh, across programming languages. So if we had our way and we could you know, take a magic wand and redo the whole computing stack uh, to be uh, you know, the way that we would ideally like things to be, um, you, we would like to see programming languages becoming much more uh, first-class citizens. So you can choose the programming language uh, that best suits the way that you want to work and that you don't, uh, you don't face um, these various penalties around data access or computing performance or uh, uh, feature support in your, in your programming language. So if you want to build applications in Rust, you can do that just as well as you could in Python or in, or in Java. Um, our computing engines, uh, we would like the libraries and, and the computing infrastructure that we're building on to be more portable uh, and more usable in, in, more, in more places. Um, we'd like them to be able to take advantage of, of hardware acceleration, you know, new innovations in CPUs and new kinds of hardware like GPUs and specialized computing chips. We'd like to, be, to see those, those improvements make their, their way um, into the majority of users' hands as soon as possible rather than taking you know, years or years um, to, for the software to be developed to take advantage of those uh, to take advantage of those platforms, um, and by sharing more and by sharing more systems code, we the the work the optimizing uh, optimizing the, the compute engines uh, will benefit you know will benefit everyone. So not not simply the users of one particular one particular computing engine. And around the data itself, um, pretty simple. We want to be able to access uh, data uh, efficiently, productively, quickly uh, in all of the places in all of the places that we that we need it. Of course, the real world is messy, and so uh, creating creating utopias uh, in in many areas of life is, is not always practical. But perhaps there are some things that, that we can do to to put ourselves on a path to make things meaningfully uh, better for all of our all of our data analytics work. Um, so to build better computing engines, 
We want to be able to take advantage of, of hardware improvements much more quickly. Uh, we'd like to have systems that can leverage hardware heterogeneity. So if you have a system that has GPUs on it, that you can leverage uh, both the CPU and the GPU uh, and to run, uh, to, to optimize for the hardware that you have to run your workloads as quickly as possible. Uh, we'd like to see more ecosystem-wide collaboration on algorithms, particularly on leveraging advanced features in, in, in hardware. Um, so, so we see canonical high performance implementations of, of the critical algorithms that we need that can be used, reused by everyone. Um, and another point with computing engines that's often lost is the, is the importance of having high quality computing um, at the small scale, at the laptop scale or the workstation scale. So you, you've, seen, you've seen so much work happen on scalable computing at the 100 gigabyte or one terabyte and up scale up to you know, the you know, multi-petabyte multi -petabyte scale. Uh, but there's been relatively little progress or comparatively little progress um, on uh, efficient, uh, efficient computing at the single node scale. And so ideally we'd like to have compute engines that work well or that can be used as the basis of a, uh, a scalable uh, you know, big data uh, uh, workload, uh, but that can also be used efficiently uh, and take advantage of uh, take uh, and be optimal optimal at the single node scale on uh, the current generation of CPUs and GPUs. In our programming languages, we, we'd like to be able to, to pick the programming language that best suits us to not have um, a, a difficult, an impossible choice between uh, a programming language that we prefer to program in, but where we pay, pay a, a significant performance penalty uh, to use that language. Um, you know, often that that overhead can can be um, you know, that, that can be the result of, of of serialization overhead associated with with data movement. Um, uh, the compute engines uh, should should create interfaces uh, to to make themselves usable uh, from from any programming language that can that can bind with their low level low level interfaces, so that you aren't forced to go through uh, necessarily a higher level language in order to access that system. Um, and on data where, frankly, the most progress has been made in recent years, um, the adoption of open standards like Parquet and ORC uh, for analytical data storage uh, has, has improved the data silo problem significantly. Um, there's still many problems around dealing with large, very large data sets, large scale metadata, um, and the creation and adoption um, of open standards that are community maintained for data storage and metadata uh, is a big part of the solution here. Um, Moving data around and accessing data, having standardized protocols for data access, for moving data between systems uh, is critical for, for, for dealing with the data silo problem. Um, and to the extent that we can reduce couplings between data storage, data access in a particular compute engine uh, to, uh, you know, to, make, to make compute engines uh, more pluggable, more interchangeable, um, to, to have that, that architectural requirement uh, you know, forces uh, you know will, will force a better design decisions and less and less lock in to particular particular compute engines. So we've been we've been working on uh, the the Apache Arrow project uh, as a um, as as a a development platform to to address these these low level uh, low level issues in data computing engines and programming languages. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Um, how how we're doing that and where we are in the process because you know many of you have heard of arrow it's been around for more than five years now um so maybe you're wondering you know when is this going to make its way into my life and make things better uh, make things better for me but we really do uh you know from from the early days in the project 2015 when we, we began putting the project together uh we saw it as a as a critical and, and fundamental part of of uh, beginning to solve um these um the, these data analytics silo problems um, around, around computing data and programming languages. So we started this project um, around five years ago uh, as a, a collaboration between a collection of data science, uh, big data and database systems developers. And the purpose was uh, to create these shared technologies that could be used as the basis of a better development platform uh, for data analytic, data, data analytic systems. So not only data access, serialization, and data movement, but also building um, better computing engines 
and having better uh, language, uh, cross language support uh, for, for building uh, the next gen our next generation of ETL, uh, feature engineering, uh, you know, data analytics, machine learning architectures. So our approach and our the way that we're thinking about the problem is you know, on the data side that we would like to see more and more systems uh, accessing data and moving data around um, in the arrow uh, in the arrow tabular columnar data format. Um, and that's the area where the most progress has been made. And I'll speak uh, uh, shortly uh, about uh, some of the systems where uh, this work has, has been done um, and it's in progress at many other, in many other systems um, around the ecosystem. Um, so it's, it's not enough to be accessing and moving data around an arrow. We also need to compute natively uh, natively on the arrow data. So we specifically designed um, the arrow the the arrow data format uh, to be uh, efficient for computing. So it run it, it uh, it's suitable for uh, efficient computing in CPUs and GPUs. Uh, and we designed the format uh, specifically for the needs um, of modern of modern hardware. And so we need to see more computing engines using arrow as its internal native data format. Um, Secondly, by building strong libraries uh, to support uh, the the arrow to support arrow in different programming languages, we can en enable them to to build to plug into um, uh, systems that are written in other programming languages uh, and achieve interoperability uh, or provide a language interface, for example, in Python or in uh, Rust or in Go um, that that uh, has you know, almost no no overhead by virtue of having a common uh, data structure, a common data format on both sides of the language divide. So, um, so the project has been growing rapidly. Uh, we've made 20 major releases. We have over 600 contributors, uh, 600 unique contributors. So we've created a vibrant uh, community around the project. Uh, we have 11 programming languages, uh, uh, soon to be 12. Uh, Julia uh, is kind of the newest language to the project. Uh, so we we've made good progress on making this a community uh, community led effort, uh, and I expect that that this uh, this this graph of contributors will continue to grow, uh, you know, up and to the right uh, as time as time goes on. Um, for the people listening here, I think the most exciting thing that we that, that we've that we've seen um, and that's making the most impact on your day to day lives is the rise of Arrow. Uh, as a, a standard format for bulk data access and data interchange. And so we've seen, um, we've seen many uh, databases and data warehouse systems uh, adopt, uh, adopt Arrow as a means of um, getting data to you more, more efficiently. So for example, when you're using, um, uh, so, so when you're using BigQuery or Snowflake, you can request data to come back to you in Arrow format. And then Arrow, Arrow data can be loaded into Pandas really, really efficiently. Um, we use we use Arrow uh, to accelerate user-defined code running um, running in Apache Spark, uh, and Spark SQL does not use Arrow internally, and so there is still is some uh, serialization overhead when when using Python on Spark or R on Spark. But by using Arrow for the bulk uh, data movement between the Spark runtime and the custom user-defined Python and R code, we were still able to make things uh, make things a lot make things a lot faster. Um, so we've seen adoption in many other places. Uh, as people have, uh, as, as pe more and more systems um, have standardized on columnar data files like Parquet and Orc, we've invested heavily in making sure that the um, the interface between Arrow and Parquet files or Orc files um, is high quality, so that we can encourage more, um, you know, that, that kind of in-memory interface where, where Arrow, uh, you know, Arrow, we want Arrow to be the dominant technology. And the storage layer uh, parquet um, that that's uh, an optimal kind of uh, pairing of, of technologies, and we've seen that um, uptake robustly, especially in the in the Python ecosystem. Um, the next uh, stage, of, you know, stage of work where that I'm really excited about is is the rise of Arrow native computing systems, and so Dremio, which uh, it was, you know, uh, I partnered with on the creation of the Arrow project from the early days, was built as an Arrow native engine uh, from the ground up. But uh, I see I put Dremio twice on the slides. I apologize for that. Um, but uh, you know, one ex one really exciting project has been um, Nvidia's Rapids project, uh, uh, the QDF library, and and related projects um, along with the Blazing SQL distributed 
uh, SQL query engine built on top of Rapids, which is a, uh, a GPU native, uh, you know, data frame project and analytics analytics framework, and has demonstrated that you can achieve um, amazingly good uh, performance, uh, not only in wall clock time, but also in power utilization and total cost of ownership. Um, so we show that by um, by using Arrow, not only do we get the benefits of this faster data access and faster data movement, but we can also bring down uh, the cost of computing by uh, by utilizing um, hardware innovations and hardware acceleration. And so I think that the role of uh, the role of GPUs and custom chips for uh, for data analytics is going to become uh, more and more uh, more and more important um, in our in our lives. Um, we're starting to see some uh, in, in the Arrow project itself. We have uh, we have a, a native query engine uh, for Arrow, which is built in uh, built in Rust called called Data Fusion. We've seen a really vibrant Rust community uh, develop there, um, and so there's a number of um, uh, projects which are using Data Fusion, which is written in Rust, as the basis of their um, of their query engines. Um, and so excited to see how that how that develops there. Um, also seeing some academic projects like the noise page project from CMU uh, adopt Arrow as their cold storage format and as part of their, their query engine runtime. And so to see Arrow embraced by the academic database community is, is an important step um, in the growth of the project and seeing but they're both not only robust adoption in industry, but also in, uh, also in the academic world. So a cool project just to give you an idea of some of, uh, of, some of what's become possible uh, in, in now in 2021, there's a new Python project called, uh, called Polars, which is a, um, named after, Pan, uh, kind of inspired by Pandas, of course. Uh, it's a data frame library similar to Pandas. Um, it is built on the Rust Arrow project and, and data fusion. So the core of it is all written in Rust, the, the, the uh, data processing, um, the kind of the internals of it, but you can use it from Python. You can extend uh, data fusion with custom code uh, written in Python. And so Python code can be pushed into the Rust data fusion engine uh, with, with zero cost, uh, which is exactly you know, the whole purpose of, of creating this, this stack of, of technology. Um, and through, uh, you know, through this project, it has, it's achieved um, you know, really impressive analytics performance. So I encourage you to, to check it out as a glimpse of uh, what, the, you know, what the future uh, what the future looks like. Um, on the in the C plus plus project in Arrow, you know we we've been uh, you know over the last couple of years been been working on creating a uh, you know full stack uh, uh, kind of data platform, uh, query execution, uh, data transport, uh, the Arrow Flight framework. Some of you may have seen other talks that I've given where I've talked about uh, talked about Arrow Flight and our use of gRPC and making it easier to. Uh, to, to add Arrow support to systems so that they can send and receive Arrow data natively uh, at high speeds. Um, and so, so if you're interested in this work, I encourage you to check out what we're doing in the, in the open source project. Um, the way that we're integrating a lot of this functionality into user languages uh, like R is through existing query interfaces. So if you're a dplyr user in, in R, um, we, we've integrated um, the, the Arrow-based uh, data access and computing functionalities natively into, into dplyr. So you can access a, um, a multi-file Parquet data set in S3 um, that is all accessed with Arrow and then query it using the same uh, primitives dplyr constructs that you're familiar with. Uh, and we'll compile this to an Arrow query internally uh, and execute it um, you know, as, as best we can uh, directly on top of Arrow. So very exciting stuff, and uh, and we'll be seeing you know a lot of improvements and new features here um, over time. So uh, so definitely a high level view of the the changes that are taking place. But but uh, you know I would say to uh, you know to keep an eye on what's happening here. Encourage your software vendors if they are not um, doing things with Arrow already to to look at how they can plug into it. Uh, provide an Arrow based interface at least for. Uh, data input and output so that you can get your data in or get your data out more quickly um, and that we can be on a path to making all these systems um, compose with each other and be a lot more uh, a lot more interoperable. So I'm very excited about the future uh, of data analytics systems and uh, and uh, you know excited you know definitely the last five years has been really interesting building this project. The next five years are going to be even more interesting and so uh, a lot of uh, a lot of innovation to happen here. So thanks for uh, thanks for uh, coming to the talk and uh, 
uh, thanks for having me, uh, uh, Tecton, and, uh, and everyone at the, at the conference. Wes, do you mind if I ask you a few questions real fast? Sure. Nice. While I blew through the intro, so we're running a little early. And okay. We get time to talk with you. Thanks for doing Great. this, man. Absolute legend. I appreciate it. And there's some cool questions coming through in Slack. Mm -hmm. The first one is more of a statement, but it's from Dave saying, oh, it's interesting. Wes didn't mention Julia when you were going through all of the different stuff. Was there a reason for that? Uh, no, no particular, no particular reason. Um, there is a, there is a Julia, uh, Julia Arrow project. Um, I mean, to be honest, I, I haven't kept up. Um, I haven't kept up too much with, um, uh, with uh, developments in data analytics specifically in, um, in Julia, but um, I'm very excited about what's, you know, what, what's, what's possible there. Uh, I think that the, um, you know, the single language, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, the best of both worlds uh, approach uh, of Julia makes a lot of sense for, um, you know, as, as a user language uh, where you can get really fast user defined functions, which are compiled by Julia that can be pushed into a general purpose, you know, query engine. So at the moment, you know, it would be relatively straightforward. I, I understand to, to write a custom function that could be uh, inlined and, or, or passed into the Rust uh, data fusion query engine. Um, so that's something I, uh, some, a proof of concept that I would be interested for somebody to build. Um, so we're, you know, we're working on getting uh, the Julia um, Arrow project uh, integrated with the, with the Apache community. And uh, I'm interested to see a, a developer community um, develop there. So I think I talked a lot about uh, about Rust in the talk because you know we've just seen this explosion of development and uh, and tons of new developers coming into the community and it seems that you know for systems like for systems development that uh, you know every people are really excited you know of course C++ is not going anywhere but it's great to see so many people uh, excited about doing uh, data analytics uh, in in Rust. Awesome, very cool. So next question for you. Do you think Arrow becomes an alternative to Parquet for storing data? That will eliminate the constant translation of Parquet to Arrow and vice versa. Um, it, it depends on what's meant by what, what's meant by storage. Um, I think for uh, for longer term or archival storage, um, Arrow is not uh, Arrow is not designed for for the needs of that. So, for example. Um, it's not intended to be uh, space efficient uh, on disk. And so if you, if you want your data to compress down to be as small as possible, but then can be read quite quickly, um, Parquet is a quite, good, a quite good format for that. So you can have um, a massive data set that, that ends up being quite small when it's encoded um, to, to Parquet format. Uh, whereas Arrow is designed um, to, uh, for, uh, for memory speed performance. So as a data format uh, for caching, um, uh, for, so as a data format for caching, it's, it's, uh, um, it's, it's, it's ideal for that where you can, you can deliver data at memory speed or at, if you've got a uh, very fast networking, you can deliver data over arrow flight at you know, more than 10 gigabits a second. Um, there's a new project at Microsoft called, uh, called Magpy. Um, where they've created a uh, an arrow based uh, data fabric that uses arrow flight to cache and access the arrow data uh, and different and different query engines and to deliver query results to users. Um, so there's different yeah I think there's different there's different needs there, um, but I think replacing Parquet uh, for uh, for archival storage, um, I think there might be scenarios where where it would make sense, but. In, in general, um, the the data formats are optimized for different you know for different needs, and we we found that the um, you know we can we we can deserialize Parquet files so fast to Arrow format um, that that um, you know it, the, the overhead there um, is not a uh, not contributing that much to to slowing down systems at the moment. But we'll see how things change over time. Of course, if if disk and cloud performance starts to approach uh, memory speed, then then I think, um, you know, I, I think I think the story might change. What would change there? But we can, you know, we'll be we'll be ready to to react when that when it, when and if that happens. Yeah, cross that bridge when you come to it. 
So next up for you is a question from Reed. As potential ways to reduce language silos, have you tried OpenAI's GPT-3 for high-level programming language inter-translation for analysis? Um, I, I, I have not. Um, yeah, I mean, to, to be honest, it sounds like, it sounds like science fiction to me, but, but, uh, you know, perhaps in the, in the fullness of time, uh, you know, we'll be able to, uh, to do, um, program, you know, code auto translation, uh, from one, uh, you know, from one language, you know, from one language to another, um, you know, I will say that the, um, you know, given what, I, what, you know, the experience of, of building a, a project like pandas which is you know very complex and has hundreds or thousands of different uh, of different apis that um you know statically reasoning about the the semantics of a particular piece of code can be really uh, can be really challenging and so to create a, a machine translation framework um for uh for code um strikes me as being uh you know very difficult i mean i think human language is also very difficult um <laughs> But uh, it's uh, it, it's a different kind of challenge where, um, yeah, I, I I'd be excited if if uh, if somebody is able to solve that problem. But but uh, it's definitely it's outside of my my outside of my wheelhouse. Yeah, for sure. So last one that I'm seeing here in the chat, and I've got one for you if you would permit me after this sure. one. But is there a good GUI front end? that is easy to use similar to VB6 or C Sharp for Python. I have tried Streamlit and Tinker, or sorry, T Kinter. There's probably mm -hmm. a way to say that that I am not privy to knowing. <laughs> um, yeah, to, to be honest, uh, I, yeah, given that I, I spend most of my time in Emacs and so uh, I, yeah, I wish I, I wish I could help more on that question, but uh, I know that uh, yeah, people build graphical interfaces for pandas now. Like there's one I heard of called called Bamboo that you could you could check out uh, oh, yeah. for programming for programming itself. Um, yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not sure what's the latest and greatest uh, uh, you know front end environment for for programming. Yeah, I understand. You're sinking your teeth into other stuff at the moment. <laughs> Yes. There's another question. So there's a few other questions that are jumping up last minute as they do. Does Arrow support common pandas data frame methods? Um, it, it is beginning to. Uh, so we we uh, so we we have a, a, a narrow subset um, of a functionality that's that's implemented. Uh, if you use if you use PyArrow, um, the Python Arrow library. Um, it's a low-level framework, so it's intended for package developers to use. So it, it provides low-level access to to various uh, to various algorithms, data access, uh, in-memory computing. Um, it's not trying to provide a, um, a an end-user experience similar to the way that Pandas is. So our goal for the Arrow libraries is to be used to build new data frame libraries, um, or to be to be used to retrofit. Um, libraries like pandas with arrow based um, computing machinery so we don't we, we don't have the desire to craft like the next data frame library um, but the low level computing facilities uh, we've built uh, we've built a number of them where you know we're, we're, we intend to, to build the uh, you know to build the rest so that uh, we can compute um, efficiently compute complex uh, complex queries um, uh, natively against against arrow data and have good performance on, you know, the current generation of, of hardware. So we have, you know, we're, we're implementing Intel optimizations for things. We'll need to implement ARM optimizations for things as well. Um, but, uh, you know, we'd like to do as much of that work in one place and to have, uh, you know, just a, a large community collaborating to build really efficient, uh, efficient code for, for Arrow. All right, last one. Well, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> You mentioned CPUs and GPUs. What about FPGAs? Thank you very much. Ah, um, I know that there has been some um, there has been some work uh, using Arrow on uh, on FPGAs. Uh, I myself have never uh, written written VHDL or uh, used used an FPGA. 
Um, but um, there's a, there's, there was a project uh, out of um, TU Delft, uh, I believe, um, where they, uh, they built a project called Fletcher, which provides uh, some, um, some glue between um, Arrow and FPGAs to make it easier to program, uh, to, to provide like easier programmability um, for, for FPGAs. Uh, so I, you know, I think, um, there, I mean, there's FPGAs and there's a number of companies now that are building, um, you know, AI optimized or, or, uh, data analytics optimized, uh, uh, kind of specialty, uh, computing chips. Um, you can look them up. I won't name them here, but, um, I, I think we will see, uh, more specialty, uh, you know, specialty hardware, um, that, uh, is, you know, can be used within a heterogeneous computing context and so maybe like certain algorithms, like this hardware is really good at aggregating data, like doing group buys. And so we'll push the data to that, to that chip to do group buys and things like that. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'd be excited about that. Nice. Okay. So last one for real this time, <laughs> they just keep popping up. So I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> What's your perspective on using protobuf as a binary storage format? In my opinion, great for in-flight data using gRPC, but haven't seen much in terms of storing proto on disk. Well, I know that Google, uh, Google warehouses a lot of data in, in, in protobuf, protobuf format. So it's certainly, um, you know, there's pros and cons uh, of doing that. So one of the, one of the cons is that you have to get the dot proto file and you have to compile, you have to, you have to run a code generator in order to access the access, the data files. So, so it, it does make things more difficult to access the data. Um, you know, there's uh, you know, there, there's definitely use cases, you know, for protobuf that don't make sense for, uh, that don't make sense for arrow, like highly sparse data with thousands or hundreds of you know, hundreds of fields that are mostly null. Um, so there's still lots of you know valuable uses for for for, for protobuf even with um, you know new you know new formats like Arrow that are uh, designed for um, analytical query processing. Mm -hmm.